fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He rose from supper and took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. Simon Peter said to him, Master, then not only my feet, but my hands and head as well. Miguel de Unamuno wrote a biography of Don Quixote, the fictional protagonist of Cervantes' masterpiece, which is probably the most influential novel ever written before the Da Vinci Code, of course. Unamuno began his biography of Don Quixote with an ingenious comparison between Don Quixote and St. Ignatius of Loyola, drawing from Cervantes' description of the Man of La Mancha and Riva Andanera's biography of the founder of the Jesuits. Unamuno describes how Ignatius set out for Montserrat to deposit his arms at the feet of the Virgin. On the road to Montserrat, he encountered a Moor who denied the virginity of the Blessed Mother. Ignatius tried to convince him without success, and the Moor rode away very conceited and arrogant. The young Ignatius had second thoughts and wondered if he should have punished the man. Ignatius wanted to let God decide, so he dropped the reins of his steed to see if the animal would pursue the recalcitrant moor or continue on the road to the sanctuary of Montserrat. The beast trotted off to Montserrat, and the Jesuit order was founded. By the way, Unamuno credited that donkey with the founding of the Jesuits. The earlier biographies show how St. Ignatius was wounded in the Battle of Pamplona and how he spent much of his time reading. But because there were no books of chivalry like the ones that he and Don Quixote loved to read, they gave him the life of Christ and the Florilegium of the Lives of the Saints. After devouring the books, St. Ignatius commented, I want to be a saint like St. Francis. Well, we have a Pope who has embraced the vocation of being a follower of Ignatian who wants to be a saint like St. Francis. Our Pope is thoroughly Jesuit, thoroughly Ignatian, right down to his fascination with St. Francis. In an interview that he had in Civiltà Cattolica, they asked the Holy Father why he became a Jesuit. The Pope said that three things about the Jesuits attracted him, and they were the missionary spirit, the community, and the discipline and he especially admired the way that the Jesuits managed their time. It's quite obvious that Pope Francis exhibits these three characteristics in spades. He's truly living his Jesuit vocation with an intense missionary zeal, a love for community and for mission, and the disciplined life that comes from not wasting anything, especially not time. I love the image of Pope Francis running around the Vatican, turning off all the lights reminds me of my dad. Shortly before his ordination, the 32-year-old Borgoglio wrote a short credo. He kept that piece of paper as a reminder of his core convictions. It's a clear indication of the habit of self-reflection so deeply ingrained in him by his Jesuit formation. He speaks of his own history and says that on a spring day in September in the Southern Hemisphere, the loving face of God crossed my path and invited me to follow him. The Holy Father is always hearkening back to that day of his own spiritual awakening and conversion on the feast of St. Matthew that found him breaking away from his friends to go to church and receive the sacrament of confession. It was there 
that he first felt called. Later he shared that his favorite painting in Rome is Caravaggio's The Calling of Matthew, where Jesus is pointing at the tax collector. And the Holy Father says he feels as though Jesus was pointing at him. It's not surprising that when he was appointed bishop, he had to choose a motto for his Episcopal uh, coat of arms. He chose miserando atque eligendum, having mercy and calling me from the homily for the feast of St. Matthew. Pope Francis embraces the introspection that is so central to Jesuit spirituality, the practice of the examen mental prayer, reflection, a review of how one is living one's vocation. Ignatian's plan to keep the Jesuits recollected in God, focused despite their activist lifestyle. His novice master, Father Jorge Bergoglio, insisted on fidelity to the practice of the examen, realizing that Ignatius's strict program of formation was to prepare men for years of self-discipline once all the props of formation were taken away. In keeping with his own Jesuit formation, Pope Francis is a man of discernment. And at times, that discernment results in freeing him from the confines of doing things in a certain way because it was always thus. On Holy Thursday, Jesus washed the feet of the 12 apostles. Uh, they were shocked and unhinged by the experience. Pope Francis has made that a very important practice in his own ministry beginning by going to the detention home, the Casal del Marmo, to wash the feet of a group of prisoners there. Many people, like St. Peter, uh, rejected that plan and preferred a more stylized liturgical gesture. But this is but a weak reflection of what the original foot washing entailed. The newly elected Pope Francis replicated the surprise and the shock of the apostles, even as he dismayed those who preferred the stylized liturgy in the basilica. This was not an innovation for Pope Francis. Already as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he's been doing this for years during Holy Week. While many were surprised that the Holy Father did not opt to celebrate Holy Thursday Mass as other popes did at the Basilica of St. John Lateran, the Holy Father was jostling our imagination because we've grown so complacent that we can no longer see beyond the familiar custom to glimpse the challenging truth. With a simple gesture, the Pope was challenging core assumptions about power, authority, and leadership. As he told the prisoners, this is a symbol, it's a sign. Washing your feet means that I am at your service. In addressing the Brazilian bishops in 2013 at the celebration of World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, Pope Francis said, unless we train ministers capable of warming people's hearts, of walking with them in the night, of dialoguing with their hopes and disappointments, of mending their brokenness, what joy can we have for our present and future journey? Father Jorge Bergoglio's former novices recount how their novice master insisted that the seminarians should go on weekends to the poorest neighborhoods to give catechism classes to the children. He used to tell them that if someone could make the catechism simple enough for the children to understand, that was a wise person. And when the seminarians returned from those poor neighborhoods, their novice master would always check to see if they had dusty shoes. If a seminarian didn't have dust on his shoes, he had some explaining to do. The same desire to teach the young Jesuits to stay engaged with the people, to be close to the little ones, is what Jesus did when he was training the apostles. Jesus took them to the temple to observe the widow, putting her last penny into the collection. The Lord does not refund her money or applaud her or give her a compliment. She's unaware that she's being observed as part of Jesus' lesson plan to his seminarian apostles. He helps them to see the poor widow through his eyes. Jesus wants his priests to see the faith and the devotion of the Anawim, the poor who are rich in faith. We have much to learn from the poor. Pope Francis is the most eloquent advocate on behalf of the poor and our obligation to help bring them programs of promotion and assistance. 
as well as by working to resolve the structural causes of poverty. However, one of Pope Francis's most impassioned pleas on behalf of the poor concerns their pastoral care. In the Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father writes, I want to say with regret that the worst discrimination which the poor suffer is the lack of spiritual care. The great majority of the poor have special openness to the faith. They need God, and we must not fail to offer them His friendship, His blessing, His word, the celebration of the sacraments, and the journey of growth and maturity in the faith. Our preferential love for the poor must mainly translate into a privileged and preferential spiritual care. The young Jorge Bergoglio joined the Jesuits in part out of his desire to be a missionary, to go to Japan. It's hard to read Pope Francis's challenge to go to the peripheries without recalling that wonderful letter of St. Francis Xavier to St. Ignatius that appears in the breviary on the feast of the great Jesuit missionary. Francis Xavier's letter contains the passion, passionate plea to his fellow priests. Many, many people are not becoming Christians for one reason. There is no one to make them Christians. Again and again, I have thought of going around to the universities of Europe, especially Paris, and everywhere crying out like a madman, riveting the attention of those with more learning than charity. What a tragedy. How many souls are being shut out of heaven and falling into hell, thanks to you. I wish that they would work as hard as this, as they do in their books, as they would to announce the gospel to the ends of the earth. I can only imagine Pope Francis writing those words of Francis Xavier. Pope Francis never got to be a missionary in Japan, but he never ceased to admire those Jesuit missionaries and others who formed the faith of the laity so well that those Christian communities in Japan survived without priests for over 250 years. In 1865, two years after Matthew Perry opened Japan to the foreigners, Father Bernard Petitjean of the Mission Etranger de Paris opened a church for foreign nationals, but was immediately visited by throngs of underground Catholics who had practiced their faith clandestinely. The French priests found that they'd all been baptized, catechized, and married in the church and all of their dead had received Christian burial. As Pope Francis observed, faith was kept intact by the gift of grace that gladdened the hearts of the laity, who only received baptism, but then continued to live their apostolic mission. Pope Francis, like Pope Benedict, has said that the catechism is not a, a catalog of prohibitions. He urges us to be positive, to emphasize the things that unite us, the thing, not the things that divide us. You must prioritize the connections between people, the path that we walk together. After that, addressing the differences becomes easier. In Evangelii Gaudium, the Holy Father shares with us that every form of catechesis should attend to the way of beauty, the via pulchritudinis, showing us that to follow Christ is not only something right and true, but also something beautiful, capable of filling life with a new splendor and a profound joy, even in the midst of difficulties. After the moral component of catechesis, which promotes growth and fidelity to the gospel, it is helpful to stress again and again the attractiveness and the ideal of a life of wisdom, self-fulfillment, and enrichment. In the light of that positive message, our rejection of the evils which endangers that life can be better understood. Rather than experts in dire predictions, dour judgments bent on rooting out every threat and deviation, we should appear as joyful messengers of challenging proposals, guardians of the goodness and the beauty which shine forth in a life of fidelity to the gospel. A fascinating study funded by the Lilly Endowment, resulted in the acronym MTD, Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. The author of the study, Smith and Denton, invented this term to describe the common religious belief among Americans. 
It's a religion that is about being nice, feeling good, and having God as some sort of a fire extinguisher in case of emergency, break the glass and say a prayer. What is missing is the kerygma, the love of God that sent Christ into the world to die on the cross, rise again, and accompany us to the end of time. The Holy Father is not a proponent of this moralistic, therapeutic deism. In his, in his Evangelii Gaudium, he begins with the words, The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and minds of all who encounter Jesus. The Pope is a true companion of Jesus, a Jesuit who puts Christ at the center of his life. At the center of the church's mission is the announcement of the kerygma. The kerygma is Trinitarian. The fire of the Spirit leads us to believe in Jesus Christ, who by his death and resurrection reveals and communicates to us the Father's infinite mercy. Pope Francis writes in Evangelii Gaudium, On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over again. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. The document of Aparecida, much influenced by the then Cardinal Bergoglio, talks about the need to form missionary disciples. The kerygma is central to this process. The kerygma is not simply a stage, but a leitmotif, a process that culminates in the maturity of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Without this kerygma, the, the announcing of the core of the gospel, the other aspects of the process are condemned to sterility with hearts not truly converted to the Lord. Hence, the church must have the kerygma present in all of its actions, announcing that God has sent his Son to the world to die on the cross and save us and rise from the dead so that we can share in the life of the resurrection. In the midst of a culture that glorifies individualism and the imperial autonomous self, the Holy Father speaks to us about communion. There can be no Christian life except in community in families, parishes, communities of consecrated life, base communities, and other communities and movements. Like the early Christians who met in community, the disciples take part in the life of the church, in encounter with brothers and sisters, living the life of Christ in solidarity and fraternity. The Holy Father speaks so much about the culture of encounter and the art of accompaniment in mentoring people in the faith. His message is a very different one from the New Age individualism of I'm the very spiritual but not religious attitude that thrives in today's culture. In a world that is so polarized and divided, Pope Francis's message is about bringing hope into people's lives and enticing many people to look at the church again. The field hospital imagery is more compelling than that of a museum or a concert hall. Most Catholics have felt energized by the focuses on God's love and mercy and the clarion call to embody the ideals of the church's social gospel in our relations with others, especially the most vulnerable and forgotten. The Holy Father has made us more aware of Lazarus, covered with sores, who is on our doorstep, suffering alone while we're absorbed in our pursuit of entertainment and creature comforts in a globalization of indifference. Evangelii Gaudium reminds us sometimes we lose our enthusiasm for mission because we forget that the gospel responds to our deepest needs since we were created for what the gospel offers us, friendship with Jesus and love of our brothers and sisters. Pope Francis fittingly celebrated his inaugural mass on the feast of St. Joseph. He has Joseph's symbol on his coat of arms, and like Pope John, added St. Joseph's name to the canon of the Mass. In his homily at the inaugural Mass, Pope Francis urges us to take care of each other and to show a little tenerezza, 
tenderness, and to protect God's gifts. One of God's greatest gifts to the church is this Jesuit Pope who, like St. Francis, wanted to be like St. Francis of Assisi. Pope Francis is helping the whole world to discover the joy of the gospel and all of this ad maiorum Dei Gloriam for the greater honor and glory of God. blessing of Almighty God through the intercession of Our Lady and Saint Joseph descend upon you, your loved ones, and your homes in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.